uh, I wanted to talk about some just basic issues um, having to do with the notions of truth and knowledge. Um, because when you get into uh, discussions with people about what they believe, um, it becomes very apparent that people have really radically different understandings of truth and knowledge. Okay? And people believe all kinds of different things. Okay? Um, so, for starters, I wanted to just uh, kick us off with a basic um, definition of truth, okay? And this is called the uh, correspondence theory. Correspondence theory of truth? Yeah, the correspondence theory of truth. That's what, or it's sometimes it's called correspondence theory. Okay. Um, now, let me preface this by saying, um, at a deeper level, as Christians, we believe that the, the truth is a person and not a set of propositions. But that's going to be like truth with a capital T. Okay? Um, at a more shallow level, we can ask just sort of the ordinary question of what makes it the case that some sentences are true while other sentences are false? Okay? So, just like you can stay really, really basic with it and, and say things like, okay, sentence, this paper is white. That's true. If I said, this paper towel is purple, I'd be lying. That's false. I said something false. Okay. So what's the difference? What makes it the case that the one sentence is true and the other sentence is false? Okay. Well, the correspondence theory of truth says, well, you have that sentence. It's got a subject and a predicate. The subject of the sentence, of course, is the paper towel. The predicate is white. So I just said about the paper towel that it's white. Okay. Now, if I go and look at reality, I have an object, an actual thing, the paper towel, and it has a property, whiteness. Okay. So the relationship between the subject and the predicate in the sentence corresponds, we say, to the relationship between the object and the property. Okay, so we've got four four moving parts in this theory. We've got at the sentence level. Okay, uh, the subject and the predicate, and then at the ob at the like level of reality. Okay, we've got an object and a property. Okay? There's a relationship between the object and the property, and there's a relationship between the sentence, subject, and the predicate. And what we want is a correspondence between these two relationships. Once you have that correspondence, you've got truth. If you fail to have that correspondence, you have falsehood. So if I say another sentence, this paper towel is purple. I have a subject, the paper towel, and I've got a predicate, purple, that fails to correspond to the way that the object and the property actually are in reality. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so very simply put, that's, I, I, that was a little bit technical, okay? But you can think of it super commonsensically, okay? Is truth is telling it like it is. When we say things that correspond to the way that they actually are, that's truth. And when we say things that don't correspond to the way that things actually are, that's falsehood. Make sense? Do you have a question? Uh, yeah. Um, didn't we really go over like what someone deems as telling you like it is is different because of our Well, we always, yeah, yeah. So we always have an interpretation of reality. Okay? But remember, I said in that teaching that it doesn't follow from the fact that we're always interpret interpreting reality, that our interpretation is incorrect. As a matter of fact, our interpretation of reality might actually correspond to the way things actually are in reality. And if they do, then our interpretation is true. And if they don't correspond to the way things actually are, then our interpretation is false. By this theory. Now, you might ask a much further and much more difficult question is, how would we ever know whether our interpretation was the right interpretation if we can never get any interpretation-free angle onto reality? Now, that's a tough question. I'm not proposing to answer that question right now. 
I'm just pointing out that in principle, there's not there's not necessarily a problem. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, as a matter of fact, I think it's very difficult to be able to ensure that your interpretation of reality is the right interpretation of reality. Um, you might need to know God for that to be possible. Okay. Um, okay. Knowledge. Okay. Let me give you a correspondingly sort of uh, easy and straightforward classic definition of knowledge. Okay. People call this JTB theory. Okay. And. Uh, also, similarly with what I just did with truth, I'll say that as Christians, there's a deeper level at which we're going to think that knowledge has to do with I vow, meeting God, knowing God, you know. Okay, there's a deeper level there, just like we say that truth is a person. But if we're just talking about surface level, how do I know that this marker is black? You know, basic everyday questions. JTB turns out to be pretty good. Okay, kind of like Newtonian mechanics, right? Uh, like in science. Um, turns out that Newtonian mechanics aren't literally true, like there are, there are corner cases, oh, actually all the time Newton, Newton's equations are not getting things exactly right. But for dealing with sort of ordinary medium sized dry goods, Newton's equations are fine. Does this make sense? Um, similarly, uh, I think we can come up with some corner cases in which JTB fails. And we can talk about deeper levels of reality at which it doesn't apply. Um, but for ordinary cases, JTB is pretty good. Okay? So why do we call it JTB? Well, there are three properties that uh, someone needs to have in order to have knowledge. Okay? First thing that they need to have is justification. Okay? So let's say. Um, Let's say that I, I probably should just be like handling torture implements on, on camera. Is that? I'm teaching. You can act like a primitive. It's a. It's all permission. Do you want? Yeah. Put that in my pocket here. <laughs> Okay, uh, does anybody know a game that was played in the last week? Between two teams? Uh, I actually don't. Alright, let's, uh, let's, we'll just pretend. Okay. Let's say that, um, I, I believe that the Reds won their game this past week. Okay. <laughs> now, let's, let's say you guys pull it up on your phone and it turns out to be true. Like they won. Okay. Did I know that the Reds won the game? No, because I just like picked at random. Okay, and I might have happened to get lucky. Okay, but that's not knowledge because it was just a lucky guess. Okay, if you guys are sitting watching the Super Bowl and you're like, uh, ah, the Steelers are gonna win, you might even have like really good reasons for thinking that the Steelers are better than I don't know the Patriots or something. I don't know. Okay, what? They said they wouldn't play. Oh, uh, right, yeah, okay, whatever. Um, you, you guys know, I'm just like cooking up random examples. Uh, uh, you might even have like reasons to think that they're much more likely than the competition to win. But before that game ends, you don't actually know that they're going to win at all. It's just a good, it may be even a good guess, but it's just a guess. Okay. So you think that in order for somebody to have knowledge, they have to have the right kind of justification. In the case of a sports game, um, maybe watching the game and seeing the outcome would justify you, would be the right kind of justification for being able to claim, yeah, no, I know who won. I know that the, the Reds won. I know that the Steelers won. Because I saw it happen. I saw, like I saw the final score. We would, that would be justification. Does that make sense? All right. Now, second thing that, it needs to, that you need to have is truth. Which we just defined. Okay. 
um, you have to actually be getting it right. So let's say that you um, you watched it, uh, the game on TV, you saw the final score, and so you believe that the Reds won their game this week. But then actually later on you come to find out that what you were watching was a replay, and in fact the, the Reds lost this week. Could you still say, no, but I know that the Reds won? No, you couldn't, because they didn't. You can't know something that's false. Okay, we take it as inherent to the no notion of knowing something that you're actually getting it right. Now, you might think that you know something because you think you have the right justification and you think it's true, okay, but it's actually not knowledge. Okay, does it make sense? Uh, third, you need to actually believe it. Uh, So, what if I came to you and said, well, I know that the Reds won their game this week, but I don't believe that they did. <laughs> Wouldn't that strike you as a little bit strange? Right? Normally we take it as being inherent to knowledge that knowledge is a case of something that I believe, but it's not just any belief. It's a special kind of belief. A belief that is both actually true and justified in the right way. Okay? So if you think about it, beliefs, if you look at all of my beliefs, they're going to be like this. And pieces of knowledge is going to be like this. Okay? So knowledge is going to be a subset of belief. Everything that I know is going to be things that I do believe. But not everything that I believe is going to be something that I know. So one way to think of it is that knowledge is just a belief that's been beefed up in the right kind of way, that's been bolstered in the right kind of way by truth and justification. Make sense? Yeah? Everybody get it? Okay. So what is knowledge? Knowledge is justified, true belief. A belief that's actually true in the real world, and it's justified in the right way. Make sense? All right, now, let's talk about realism versus nominalism, all right? Realism is a belief, a philosophical position, about the nature of concepts and terms that we use, okay? It's the belief that these concepts actually apply to things out there in the real world. Okay, and you can see how this has something to do with correspondence theory. Okay, so we say the word oak tree. There's one down there. Right, there's an oak tree over there. When I say that word oak tree, I mean something. Okay. Now the philosophical question is, does that meaning actually correspond to anything in reality? Is there such a thing as oak tree-ness? Or, the alternative position is, no, there's just a lot of trees that we happen to for whatever reason, group together and put the label on it as calling it oak tree. Okay? But that label is purely a human invention. In reality, there is no such thing as the species oak tree. Or it's actually like a genus, right? Okay? There is no such thing as the genus oak tree. That's purely just a human invention that we're slapping onto those things out there that in themselves aren't oak trees. They're just objects. In fact, there aren't even trees in reality. There are just things that we happen to conveniently group this bunch of things under the label tree and other things under the label rock and other things under the label grass. Does this make sense? All right. 
So those two positions that I described, the first one is realism. Position that by and large, maybe not all the time, but by and large, our concepts actually do map onto real groupings in reality. That there really is such a thing as trees. That when we employ the concept of trees, we are actually, this is a common philosopher shop talk, carving nature at the joints. Okay, we're actually discovering, by our carving it up using certain terms, we're discovering a real distinction between, yeah, there are these kinds of things over here, and then these kinds of things over here. And we're calling it, we're choosing to call this kind of thing trees. We could have called it blah bleeds. Okay, so the label isn't really important. Okay, but we are sort of carving off a set of things that actually are different than other things. Those are trees and not rocks. Okay, does this make sense? The alternative position is called nominalism. This comes from the Latin word nomen, which is name. Okay, and so nominalism is the belief that, uh, no, that's just names. Purely just names that we're slapping onto things without any real justification. Okay, does everybody see how that works? All right. Now, connection that I want to draw is if you're going to hold to something like the correspondence theory of truth, you're going to want, you're going to need to have some version of realism. Okay. Whereas if you're a nominalist, you're going to have to have some other story that you tell about truth. Uh, and typically the, the novelist is going to say something like this. A true sentence is one in which the conventional names that you're employing in the subject and the predicate position in the sentence somehow hook up with each other in the right way. But it's not being held accountable to any objective reality. Does that make sense? Because how, how could you, if these are purely just, if all the words and concepts we're using are purely just human conventions, and they don't really have any correspondence to reality, how could you ever figure out what the right correspondence was? Or actually, not just, we couldn't figure it out, there just wouldn't be any. Does this make sense? Yeah? Okay. Any questions here? I, I just covered some like pretty, pretty tough concepts. Pretty fast. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, it seems like realism and nominalism are like not so much focused on, for example, with the label oak tree, the fact that like the actual label that we use linguistically is arbitrary yeah. in some sense. Yeah. Like, all of trees, blah, 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 blah. Right. And like, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But rather the fact that like the concepts that we're using do or don't mm -hmm. necessarily have to correspond with the way reality actually is. Is that true? Um, yeah, that's one argument or one line of thinking that leads to novels. But notice it doesn't have to. Well, like whether or not it really does correspond with how reality actually yeah, maybe I'm just, I'm not following. I'm not communicating super clearly. I just wanted to make sure I understood the distinction, I think, between like the linguistic side of right, the these side. kinds of things and the philosophical concept. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, um, philosophers were mostly not super concerned about the words. We're more, much more concerned about are our concepts mapping onto reality or aren't they? Mm -hmm. Okay, because um, yeah, it is a fairly trivial point that yeah, like why do why do we call those things trees? Obviously, other languages have other words in, in the sense of other sounds. Mm -hmm. So what? What does that you know? What, what does that matter? Right um, now, sort of side point. Um, People like to say, well, we could have just as well called it anything we want. But actually, that's false, uh, because language is a social phenomenon, um, and it emerges historically. 
And so you actually can't just wake up tomorrow and start calling trees blogs and expect people to understand you. Uh, in order to successfully communicate, you have to play by the rules. Okay. And so it's not a purely arbitrary assignment of sounds to things. Okay. Um, it does have to develop somehow socially, but not just it's not a purely um, intra-human activity. It language, as a matter of empirical fact, forms in human beings' interactions with the world together. Mm -hmm. And so it's not. It, um, it, there's a sort of common sense notion. Yeah, well, I could have just as you know, if I'm calling it tree, I could have just as easily called it blah. But actually, that's false. Right. Um, so that point aside, yes. Even if we grant uh, the arbitrary nature of sounds assigned to things, um, which the historical linguistic point aside, it does kind of seem like, yeah, there's not really any necessary connection between the sound tree and like those things. Okay. Um, the, the real concern is really actually about our concepts. The concept of a tree. Yeah, our concept of a tree, is that actually describing a real class of things in the world? Or could we just as easily have carved it up as um, woody biological organisms that are less than three feet uh, tall and water? Call those, call anything that's one of those things, morgues. And woody biological organisms that are uh, higher than three feet um, and um, granite and the sky, call any, any of those things Glogs. Would that way of carving up reality have been have been just as valid? Right. Um, the nominalist, a hardcore nominalist, is committed to the to the idea. Yeah, that would have been just as valid. Might not be as convenient, but it'd be fine. Yeah. Yeah. And it. And all of our concepts are just as arbitrary as the ones that I just drew. Yeah. Yeah. So. Is realism the acceptance of correspondence theory and nominalism the rejection of correspondence theory? No, because correspondence theory is a theory about truth, which is at the level of whole sentences, which are multiple concepts joined together. Uh, realism versus nominalism is a theory about uh, individual concepts and reality. Now, what I was suggesting though is that there's a link between the two. It's very hard to hold to a rigorous correspondence theory if you don't also hold realism. I'm sure there's some weird logician out there that's tried. Pretty much always realism and correspondence theory. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's it's very hard to see how they could work. To, you know, one could work without the other. Does it make sense? Yeah. Okay. Now, just for for kicks and giggles, I wanted to share my special brand of realism, which Mike and I were talking about the other night. It's Platonism. Okay. Um, Platonism is a special way of explaining how it is that our concepts are actually mapping onto something in reality. Um, but notice there are other ways of being a realist about your concepts. Okay. Aristotle has a good one. Uh, Thomas Aquinas follows him and improves upon it. Okay. The Platonist says, okay, look, you've got a tree, tree A, you've got a second tree, Call that tree B. You've got a third tree that's maybe a little different. Okay, tree C. And you've got, just make some room here, you've got a rock, B. How is it that we know that these three entities are trees and this fourth one isn't? You know, it's the classic game, Sesame Street, which one of these doesn't belong? Okay, which Wait, magically, you could play that game like as a four-year-old because <laughs> you could see that certain things were grouped together and other things weren't, like they didn't belong. Um, maybe that's an indication that we're grasping re real groupings in the world. Okay. Um, the Platonist says these three things are all trees because there's this 
fifth element here in the picture, which is treehood. All right, or treeness, we'll say. And treeness itself is not a tree. In fact, it's not something you can see, touch, taste, hear, or feel at all. It's not a spatiotemporal object. It's outside of space and time. It's just it's an essence. It's not even a concept in your mind. It just is what it is. It's an essence. Okay. And A is a tree because it participates in treeness. It has treeness in itself. Uh, B is a tree because it participates in treeness. And C is a tree because it participates in treeness. Okay. And somehow, human beings are just so constituted that we're able to look out at the world, and when we see A, we see treeness in A. And when we look at B, we see treeness in B. And when we look at C, we see treeness in C. And we're able to say, yeah, A, B, and C are trees. And I look at D, and I'm like, no, D, D doesn't have treeness. It doesn't participate in treeness. Because I'm able to see it with my mind. Right? And so I exclude D from the, from the set of trees. Okay? Does this make sense? Okay. Now, real quick, to just tie that in with the Christian worldview. Um, if it's true that this treeness is not a spatiotemporal object, it means it's eternal. It's not temporal. It has no beginning or end. It's not that treeness came into existence on Tuesday last week. <laughs> right? Trees might have first come into existence, you know, so many thousand years ago or whatever. Okay? But in order for a tree to come into existence at all, there's got to be treeness for it to participate in. Otherwise, you could never have trees in the first place. Okay? But Christians believe that there is nothing outside of God that is co-eternal with God. Because God is the maker of all things, seen and unseen. Okay? So, once you put those ideas together, and, and we can talk at length about why this has to be the way, this way, um, it turns out that if you're a Platonist, about reality, and you're a hardcore theist, you're going to eventually be committed to something like the thesis that treeness is an idea in the mind of God. Okay, These essences that things participate in are somehow an aspect of God. And I think the best way to go is to, to think about them as ideas in the mind of God. That somehow we, looking out at that tree, catch a glimpse of an idea that God has and has always had. And when he creates things, he just brings individual things in space and time into participation with certain ideas that he has. Like, oh, I want this thing to be a tree. I know what a tree is, so make it a tree. See how that works? Yeah? Um, I, the reason I'm showing that is because I think that this dramatically totally changes your whole worldview. If you can walk outside and see those things out there as temporal, very shortly lived part instances, participations in an awesome, beautiful idea that your, your God and your king has had from the beginning of time, or since before the beginning of time, okay? That, I think, should draw you to worship, right? That everywhere you look, you have never seen an object, get this, you have never seen an object in your whole life that has not revealed to you an aspect of God. Right? Because every object that you've ever seen, one of the nisses that it participates in, one of the internal essences that it participates in, is being what it takes to exist. That's an idea in the mind of God. Uh, a lot of things that you look at are beautiful. That means they participate in beauty. That's an idea in the mind of God. Okay, a lot of things uh, that you look at, mountains, the sky, clouds. Okay. All of them are participating in an idea that God had. And so by looking at them and trying to understand, hey, what does it mean to be a cloud? What does it mean to be the sky? What does it mean to be a mountain? You're looking into the mind of God when you think about those things. Yeah, yeah pretty legit. Whereas, if you're a hardcore nominalist, 
you're going to look at things and say, eh, yeah, you know, um, we happen to call those things mountains, but we might have just not had a concept or a word for, for those things. Um, so when you look out at the world, what you're really doing is you're looking into the mind of man. You see the difference? Okay. You're, so by studying, by asking the question, what is a cloud? What is the sky? What is a mountain? You're really asking questions about society. You're asking, huh, I wonder why it is that a great many people have decided to uh, have this convention amongst themselves that that thing should go by the name of the sky. So you're, the inquiry about the sky is really an inquiry about human beings in society with each other. And you're sort of doing an investigation into the mind of man. Does this make sense? The difference? Yeah? Is that so compatible? Say, say again? Is nominalism so compatible with Christianity? Yeah, many nominalists think so. Uh, nominalism actually really sort of originated with um, uh, William of Ockham, at least sophisticated nominalism. You know, and he was a Franciscan monk. You know, so at least as far as he was concerned, he thought that he was, you know, a faithful Christian, and that this was fully compatible with the Christian worldview. Okay. Um, now, I think since then the history has played out, and uh, there was this great, huge debate between realism and nominalism at the end of the Middle Ages. In fact, that was the defining philosophical debate of the age. Okay. Um, and as it so happens, the nominalist team turned into the atheistic Enlightenment, and the realist team turned into the conservative believers. <laughs> okay, so I think a very good case can be made just from history um, that at least within nominalism there's a heavy tendency and push towards atheism, right, and towards skepticism, which we'll talk about here in a second. Okay, um, so I actually think that ultimately it's not compatible with theism. Um, at least at, at the psychological level, it's going to be extremely difficult to hold those two beliefs together. Um, although at the logical level, it's hard to see at the outset where the contradiction lies. Right? Does that make sense? Um, there's a lot of really good books on that subject. Um, I would recommend um, Richard Weaver's Ideas Have Consequences. One of the chapters in there, he sort of traces why it is that nominalism leads to sort of amoralism and atheism. Yeah. Um, okay, let's, let's keep moving, let's, lest we get bogged down. Okay, so skepticism. Again, shotgun approach. We're just kind of trying to give you guys some, some uh, familiarity with basic worldview concepts in this uh, domain. Okay, um, hopefully you can kind of work out for yourselves how they all relate to each other. Skepticism, okay, is the philosophical position that knowledge is impossible. All right, let me repeat that. Skepticism is the philosophical position that knowledge is impossible. No human being has knowledge. Okay. Now, let me warn you, a lot of my freshman students get this wrong. Okay. Um, skepticism does not mean being skeptical about things. Okay. In a certain sense, all philosophers are skeptical, have a skeptical attitude. In other words, they don't just like take things on face value. You know, they ask questions. So, in a certain sense, it's good to be skeptical in the sense of like, yeah, like ask questions. Don't just like believe anything you're told. Um, you know, like don't don't trust people that hand you candy. You know, on the street. Okay. You know, yeah. yeah there's a healthy skepticism. Okay, but that's kind of like the ordinary street folk meaning of the word skepticism. In philosophy, as a technical term, skepticism means what I said it, said it means. It means the theory, the theory, first of all, that knowledge is impossible, that one can't have knowledge. Okay. Now, of course, the, um, the snarky reply to that is, well, how do you know? Okay, well, how do you know that knowledge is impossible? Um, and no matter how you answer that question, it gets you into trouble. Okay, because um, if you say I don't, then the non-skeptic can just be like, okay, well, great, <laughs> right? If you say I do, then the non-skeptic can be like, great. 
And then you might ask, yeah, but what about just the sentence, there is a God? Is it just true, full stop? The relativist would say, no. There is no such thing as truth for nobody. Every truth is a truth for somebody. Does this make sense? Yeah. Now, again, I really, uh, I don't know any uh, uh, well-respected philosopher that's a thoroughgoing relativist. Okay. Um, and here's the reason why. It, like, skepticism is easily self-defeating. Okay. Because let's say that, that Rachel and I uh, are having this discussion about relativism. And uh, Rachel believes in God. I don't believe in God. I want to get out of a fight. So I'm like, well, you know, that's fine. That's truth for you. That's, that's fine for you to believe that. Uh, I believe this. And you have your truth. I have my truth. We're done. There is no, there is no ultimate truth. Um, well, Rachel can say something very clever at this point. She can say, well, what about the truth of relativism? I don't believe that relativism is true. What am I committed to say as a relativist? That's true for you. So that means that as far as Rachel's concerned, relativism is false. Which, if relativism is false for Rachel, then she is licensed to say that I'm just plain old wrong. So we're back to where we started. The place I didn't want to be in. The place of, have, of granting her the ability to say that I'm just plain old wrong. <laughs> right? So if I, if I grant relativism, okay, then I've got to grant her relativism about relativism. Which, if she doesn't want to be a relativist, means I've just given up relativism in the debate. Okay. Now I might still maintain, yeah, but relativism is true for me. Okay. And that's fine if I want to live in my own little world and not talk to anybody. But as soon as I want to actually engage in conversation with, Re with Rachel, by my own logic, I'm licensing her to say, no, you're just plain wrong. Absolutely. And not relatively. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, I could go another way. Okay. I could say, well, the truth about God, that's true for you. And uh, the, the truth that there is no God is true for me. Okay. And you could say, well, what about relatively? I said, ah, special case. It's absolutely true that relativism is true. <laughs> that's not just a true for you and true for me, okay? That's just true full stop. It's true, it's, it's the absolute truth that relativism is the way that it is. Okay, then of course, that seems like special pleading. Okay, it's an ad hoc response. Balance. And it also seems like very strangely self undermining. Right? Does it make sense? Yeah, everybody? Good? So, skepticism is one way of saying it. Uh, skepticism is no objective, subjective term. No, there is no knowledge. no knowledge. Yeah, typically the skeptic, if there is a skeptic, is a skeptic because he actually does think that there is some objective, absolute way that it is, and that we poor human beings are so ill-equipped epistemically to know so anything about it. So is true, but we just can't figure but it out. But we can't know it. Can't know it. Yeah. Now, so then relativism is there is no objective truth and a very subjective truth. Uh, yeah, relativism negatively is the thesis that there is no objective truth or absolute truth, that there's only truth relative to a subject. Yeah. So, didn't you say that there's basically no skeptic or relativist philosopher or philosophers because you pretty much have to stop being a philosopher. Yeah. <laughs> You're yeah. like, well, why are we even talking? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I mean. But there but when you go out kind of on the street, so to speak, and talk to ordinary folks, like when I when I kind of yeah, like no, I'm survey saying. my philosophy students, tons of them are skeptics, tons of them are relativists. It doesn't seem that one that's going to like, cast down your philosophy. It's just like saying, like, no philosopher would hold that position because then they would cease to be a philosopher. Right. Yeah. And more importantly, once you, seri once you actually think about the position, the position itself defeats itself. It's sort of like Christians who believe uh, the only thing you ought to believe is the stuff in the Bible. Think about that. It's called biblicism. Okay, um, that belief that is nowhere in the Bible. 
Nowhere in the Bible does it tell you that you should only believe the things in the Bible. And so if you're a thoroughgoing Biblicist, the first belief you should give up is Biblicism. <laughs> Yeah, it's the same thing for science. Yeah, And similarly, skepticism. If you really do believe that you can't know anything, the first thing you should claim not to know is whether skepticism is true or not. If you really are a relativist, okay, the very first thing you should be <coughs> relativistic about is relativism. I feel like there is kind of a response to that, which is just kind of like a shrug. Right, yeah, yeah. He's now, um, <laughs> you should know that in rational debate, Right? Like, if we're having a conversation and the standards of that conversation are rational, <coughs> there's always non rational moves that the other person is free to make. Um, they can just dig in their heels and continue to believe a conclusion, even when they've admitted the premises and admitted that the argument from those premises for the opposite of the conclusion they believe is valid. You can just be like, no, I'm just not going to be rational. Like, you can do that. You can just walk away from the conversation, just, just stop. Right? Um, you can just like shout louder. <laughs> right? Uh, you can just like shrug your shoulders. Um, you could just like set your jaw and like refuse to believe things that obviously, or like refuse to admit things that you obviously do believe. Right? Uh, like when, when you push relativists and you're like, wait, do you believe that rape is wrong? And they're like, not really. <laughs> Right? And then like the next day you see them like crusading on Facebook, like, you know, with this great like moral vigor. You know. It's like, no, okay, so you do believe that's wrong. You just didn't want to admit it in the conversation, so you either overthrow your position. Right? Um, so so yeah, like you should know, and this is this is one of the reasons why I encourage all of you guys, unless you have unless you really sort of know what you're doing, not to get into arguments about worldviews. Especially with like sort of ordinary folk because most ordinary folk are not going to play by the rules. So you can bring out your clever little, like, ha ha, skepticism defeats itself. But to an ordinary skeptic who's not a philosopher yet, most of the time they're just going to be like, so? <laughs> it's not going to phase them, right? Um, now at that point, they're just being irrational, that's fine. Okay. But most people are most of the time. Most of you guys are most of the time. Um, okay. <laughs> it's just true. I, 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 like I'll admit, human beings, most of the time, we go through our, our, our days and we're not being altogether rational. Yeah. Uh, could you explain the fallacy of responding that relativism is an absolute truth? Yeah, it's special pleading. Um, so you're you're making an exception uh, just to win. In other words, so so it works like okay, here's a general thing that I want to claim. Oh, but I'm going to draw a special exception for my own side. Is that a logical fallacy? Yeah, it's called special pleading. Okay. Yeah. It's an informal fallacy, not a formal fallacy, but yeah, it's still, it's still a logical fallacy. Um, okay. Now, switch gears a little bit, okay? Um, foundationalism versus coherentism. These are actually two serious uh, philosophical positions. The foundationalist believes that all knowledge claims need to be grounded by more fundamental knowledge claims, and those knowledge claims need to be grounded by more fundamental knowledge claims, so forth and so on, until you get to a foundational level that is ungrounded, that is just sort of brute facts, that's what we call them. Okay. And the goal would be to get to brute facts that are the right kinds of brute facts. Uh, best case scenario is that they're completely self-evident. They sort of present. So like the proposition, like this would be a brute fact, is that A equals A. Right? That for, for, every, for every case of A, for anything, it's identical to itself. That would be the case. That would be an example of a brute fact. I don't have an argument for that. It's just supposed to be self-evident. So would that be the same thing as saying self-evident? Um, no. A brute fact is a fact that's at the bottom of my sort of knowledge pyramid, and it's brute because it's just at the bottom. It doesn't have any justification. Um, best case scenario, what a lot of philosophers strive for is to make all their brute facts self-evident facts. 
but not everybody does. So for instance, like I think Elizabeth Anscombe thinks that like a lot of things that we believe and ought to believe are just plain brute facts. Like this chair, this, this marker is black, uh, that's a chair, um, murder is bad. But those are just brute facts, they don't, they, they, they don't have arguments for them. And all of our other beliefs we should sort of build on the basis of those. I'm, for, forget the Elizabeth Anscombe, Anscombe thing, I might be misrepresenting her. Uh, it's been a while since I've read her, her essay on brute facts. So can you believe the real technical Yeah, foundationalism is a theory of epistemology that all knowledge must ultimately be grounded upon a foundation that is itself ungrounded. So the picture here is, is of a pyramid that I have, or, or like a tower or something. So I have a foundation level of brute facts. Okay, these are the things that just I don't have arguments for. They're just my my basis level. And then every other thing that I claim to know is built on top of these. And then things are built on top of those, and then things are built on top of those, and so on, so forth, and so on. Okay, and I build up a my system of knowledge on this foundational level. Okay. But for any brick in here, let's, let's say that this is my belief that um, water is made up of hydrogen and oxygen. Well, that's based on my prior belief that uh, people have performed, uh, what was it, electrolysis, right, and uh, separated out the hydrogen and oxygen in water, and that's based on my uh, prior belief that um, you know, if you can separate a substance into two things that, you know, that's the things that make it up, and then that's based on my prior belief that, uh, you know, we can trust our, our sensory experience, and this is, you know, like, that my textbooks are not lying to me, you know, and ultimately I'll get down to some, some rock bottom basis beliefs. So, are empiricism and rationalism both foundationalists, mm -hmm. but just have different yeah, yeah, exactly. They have different, they, they offer us different basement level foundational things to start from. But they're both foundational instruction. That's correct. So, from empiricist, which you seem to touch? Yeah, immediate sensory experience would be the foundation, would be the stuff that forms the foundation level, and then you build everything else on that foundation. For rationalism, the foundation level would be like a priori truths. Yeah, A equals A. Um, and then also, like for instance, um, Descartes, a, a foundationalist, he thinks one of our foundation level truths would be I exist. Just because, because, or actually the foundation level truth would be I am thinking. So therefore I exist. Uh, on the basis of those two things, you would say that I'm finite, so therefore I'm not God, uh, so therefore I didn't create myself, so therefore there must be something that caused my being, it's infinite. Um, so forth and so on. Uh, does it make sense? Yeah? Okay. The alternative is coherentism. Okay? And the picture here is, is more like of a spider web. Okay? Alright? So, in this, in this web, okay, maybe this belief supports this belief. Okay? This belief might support this belief. This belief might support this belief and this belief. But this belief supports this belief. And this belief supports this belief. And this belief supports back where we're starting. Okay. Now you might, the foundationalist charges, yeah, but that's just circular reasoning. And the coherentist responds by saying, no, it's not quite circular. Okay. What matters is that all of my beliefs, all of them, systematically support one another and form a coherent web without any tears or rips or contradictions. Okay. So what I'm looking for to justify, and both of these are, are theories about what it takes to be the J in JTB theory, what it takes to, for, for somebody to claim proper justification. The coherentist just says, look, what matters is that when you try to justify your beliefs, um, you remain completely coherent and consistent with all of your other background beliefs. Okay. Yeah, uh, the coherentism 
is the, the thesis that uh, all knowledge claims uh, must remain coherent and consistent with the web, the total web of a subject's beliefs. And of course, in the web, none of these individual beliefs are going to be rock bottom. And in fact, one of the, the, the coherentists, say the foundationalists, um, hey, our, our system has this advantage that we don't actually have any unjustified beliefs. <laughs> All of our beliefs have reasons. And the foundationalists would totally be like, well, none of your beliefs. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> the, the foundationalist response, of course, is, yeah, actually none of them have reasons. All of them. Right, does it make sense? Yeah. Now, uh, actually, both uh, both of these there are Christians that think both of these. Okay, so it's not immediately apparent why a Christian would have to commit to one of these systems over the other. Um, but you you should know that there it is. Okay. Um, all right. Last thing I'll talk about is just this term fallibilism. Okay. A fallibilist uh, thinks that. Knowledge is compatible with being wrong. Okay. That someone can know something even when it turns out that they could be wrong about that thing. You say that again. A fallibilist believes that someone can know something even when they could <coughs> be wrong about it. I will put it technically for my. Yeah, fallibilism is the proposition uh, that S knows that P, right, this proposition, is consistent with possibly
crazy skeptical challenges to knowledge, right? Um, like brain or bad head cases, okay, that we can go into. But just, just throwing it out there, okay, um, so that you guys know it's a thing. So foul, the fallibilist would think, no, to know that, that P, maybe all that I need to have is a certain confidence that P, or a certain link between uh, thinking that P and my evidential Um, but I can I can say that and then turn right around and admit that yes, in principle, it's logically possible that all the same evidence I could have all the same evidence and P be false because I'm actually the matrix, for example, right? Or Descartes' C. Make sense? I'm sorry? That face look, that level, they seem like more of a semantic. No, they're, they're actually very substantive disagreement. Yeah. Um, about the nature of knowledge. So, so if you want my real honest answer, um, I think, I only sort of play a correspondence theorist on TV. Um, in reality, I'm like a hardcore Platonist, so I actually don't think that we have any knowledge about uh, spatiotemporal particulars. At best, we have true belief, and uh, but we but I'm not a skeptic. So I think we have knowledge about the forms, the essences that we're talking about. Okay, um, and so I'm an infallible infallibleist about that kind of knowledge. I think that it's it, you cannot possibly have a noetic grasp of a form and be wrong about that form. Uh, but at the level of sort of ordinary talk, I'm willing to say, like, no, I know that this marker is black, right? Uh, like, of course I do. Um, but then also turn around and admit, yeah, but I don't know, like, I haven't completely ruled out the possibility that we're all in a computer simulation right now, <laughs> or that I'm a brain in a bat. So of course it's logically possible that I'm wrong about the marker being black. Logically. 